Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we have Michael Tazarian joining us. And today we're going to be discussing one of the forgotten greats, Professor Julian Jaynes. And uh, we'll be discussing the origins of religion. That's right. Uh, thanks very much, Esoteric. What an incredible subject. Uh, one could speak for hours on the work of Julian Jaynes. Uh, and yeah, a forgotten genius. He, he was uh, at Princeton. He was at Yale. How come we don't know this guy's work? I came across his work uh, in the early 90s, working in bookshops in the Bay Area. I saw this unusual book, just the look of it. <clears throat> uh, what were the publishers thinking? Just this white cover, Ha ha ha, you know, uh, and this big black and white title on the front, the origins of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. I mean, who's going to chew on that? And it came out in 1976, published as a book, but it was based on an earlier paper. I think he did in, in 1972 <coughs> and immediately it caused a, a flurry, and uh, and he died in 1997. So really, one could argue that you know he wasn't around to argue his case when a lot of new neuro scientific discoveries had been made, ones that lean more in the direction of proofs, and and then what sadly happens is other people who have similar theories get the notoriety and the great man himself sort of fell by the wayside. He's acknowledged by some neuroscientists, some open-minded psychologists, but generally speaking, he's kind of forgotten. I think of him as one of the most important thinkers ever. His ideas, uh, I've got future plans to do all sorts of um, programs that uh, might be on consciousness, on neuroscience and things like that and sort of breaking through the material materialistic mindset now he he technically was a materialist he stayed within a materialist framework but anyone reading his works knows right away oh yeah he was so much more than that his ideas pertain to more than that but you know just the fact that he's really still not honored is a remarkable whatever books are out there i think i have reviews on amazon on most of the books, you know, if you go to the Julian Jane Society, you'll find that he had a small school of followers. Some of them wrote books or edited books. I've done uh, positive and negative comments on, on Amazon, but uh, I love his work, you know. It's a huge impact for our subject, for the origins of religion, because if you're gonna believe something, <clears throat> try to base it on reason as well as faith. Uh, look to, important uh, psychological underpinnings now what james does you know we'll just we'll just cover it in short here is he's really asking you look in the thinking process not only what is thinking but what is this voice in your head that you're in communication with that you're in actual dialogue with the voice you take for yourself it has your signature on it this little voice you know unless you're a schizophrenic or something or a multiple personality problems normally you have this autobiographical self inside so he goes on to say then what is this inside we're inside okay we have these cavities you know every organ sits in a cavity the pineal gland sits in a cavity so yeah it can't, it can't be dismissed that there's no inside but where inside exactly is this process of thought and where inside is located this voice in your head that you know that you speak with or that you take as yours i mean already once you start looking into this level of uh consciousness you keep finding divides well you don't have to it's, there's nothing odd about that you can take out a brain and you see a divide more than one but there's the two big hemispheres there's the corpus callosum there's the uh mammalian brain and this brain stem so there's plenty of divides but we're exactly is this interior space coming from where you consult with yourself or you have this running dialogue. 
And where did you get the idea in the first place that it's your voice? So if you listen to that voice in your head, you have spent a whole lifetime guaranteed and you've never, unless you have schizophrenic problems, you have never doubted that that voice, the sound of it is you. But James is asking, why did you do that? Why are you doing that? Maybe, maybe it's not you as people with schizophrenia, you know, sort of uh, testify, or at least their reality is very different. What about multiple personality disorder? There's like tw up to 12 different voices. Which one of those voices is the alpha voice? You see, so suddenly, as we say, this is going to pertain to reality because don't the people who are God-inspired, whether it's the stylites from centuries ago or, you know, a guy living in a barrel or, or some disciple of Jesus or one of the prophets, and now you got the evangelist standing up going, I heard the voice of God last night. Uh, where did that come from? Where did that whole phenomenon of hearing God in your head now or the devil in your head come from? And do you know how few religious people even bother with that? And yet the Bible is filled with it. Uh, the, the history of, of, of religion, uh, you know, and we're not talking, see, James is not just talking here about Christianity. He's talking about the religions of the world, be it over in China or wherever else. I'm just trying to make sure that it's phrased in modern language, where you have this sense of self and you have a voice that you take for the self and you have this internal space where this is meant to be happening. Now, animals don't have anything like that. Even if they have a sense of personal identity, it's very foggy. It's very woolly. It's by no means sharp and defined. It's mostly on an instinctual level. There's no real introspection, because this is a very key word with Julian James, introspection. And the man had so much to say about it because he said that this introspection is actually one of the most recent phenomena in terms of consciousness and reality. He couldn't date it even past the Homeric period, less than a thousand years BC. So 3,000 years from where we are now. It sounds like a lot, but it's not in, in, the, in the greater histories of the world. We'll, we'll go into that in a minute. But again, the God-inspired person often claims, or, and even if they're legitimate, they're saying, it's a thing in my head. I hear it. He, God talks to me. But James is saying, Dozens of gods talked to people centuries ago in what he called the bicameral period, right? The origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral period. What, what the hell is the bicameral period? Well, this is a period uh, about 3,000 years BC uh, up until, say, the Homeric period of about eight, eight centuries, 800 years BC. It's not very clear because the part he's really talking about, the epoch he's talking about, is the period of decline, the breakdown of the bicameral period. So we're not really sure how long the bicameral state of mind that he describes, how long it was. You have to really read other people, and it gets into you know complex areas. Uh, but but the key for for us to understand it is about three thousand years ago. It, it is a period that has started to break down. And that's what his book shows you. He gives you evidence for this, right? Um, so the internal space and what we call today introspection, or as I said, that biographical I-ness, I, I have an autobiographical, I know what I did yesterday. I can think back to my childhood. Where does that autobiographical sort of thread, that history, that chronology, how does it get assembled? And just the very fact that it's mostly internal, it defines my eye. Was there a period in history? He's saying he believed that there was a period in history where that didn't exist. But that period corresponds with the rise of Judaism, which then affects Christianity. A different kind of mentation, a different kind of thinking. And also the most extraordinary thing, we probably won't touch on it here a lot, but just to throw out, just to make people you know, who are listening to this understand, there's a metaphorical space in your head. Digging around in the head doesn't find, like I say, you can find cavities and you can sure find cultures who believe it's coming from here. My, uh, you know, my voice speaks from my stomach. My voice speaks from the heart. It's right there in Plato and, and the Greeks. But again, it seems to be more a metaphor. The whole idea of an internal consciousness internal dialogue, internal thoughts, internal uh, capacities like introspection. They're not really in 
a true physical space. They're in a metaphorical space. So how the hell did that come about? In fact, how did metaphor at all come about? You know, I'm as hungry as a wolf or I'm as cold as a block of ice. You know, I could eat a horse. Yeah. Where does, where, what's that? Why does that infuse our language? We're not going to look at that today, but why do, where is, what is metaphor? Where did it come from? Why do I, yeah. now today we got like, everything's just like, you know, like, yeah, it was like this, like, and we just add the word like right into any sentence, no matter what sentence it is, well, sure enough, there'll be two or three likes in it. Like is metaphor. If something's not itself, but it's like that, then nothing is of itself. I'm not describing anything of itself. And I'm relying on the metaphor. It's like something else. But if I go to that something else and you have to describe it, you go, well, it's like something else. Right. So nothing is as it is. Everything is defined by something, something other. And that's become standardized. Uh, this is a standardized acceptance. Where does the idea of metaphor and simile even come from? Why do we communicate like that? No. Uh, he or she talks like a, a empty can rattling. Or, you know, there's so many uh, examples of this. It's incredible. Uh, and, one, and one would do well to observe how we speak in metaphor. It does also have an impact in, ter in terms of religion. Because right away, think of sun worship. Sun worship is uh, and, and the attributes of the sun and of light. Isn't that all around religion? The illumined one, he beamed like the, the great light. I saw a great light. He was illumined. I became enlightened. What is all this? Metaphor, metaphor, metaphor. Holy Mother Church. So just bear that in mind. But James is wanted to hone in on how did this all even begin? If there's no genuine internal space where this you can dig in and put a microscope and see it, then it's obviously a metaphor. Well, how did metaphor come about? And he links it to language. He links it to the breakdown of the bicameral period. Because before that, in what he called the bicameral period, something else was going along. That's what we really want to explore is what was going on. But a lot of other questions come from this. But again, just think of it in, in very basic terms. Introspection, the idea that you have a personal voice inside your head, where you can sit there and abstract from reality, a particular thing that just happened, learn from it, think back on it. How do I feel about that? Hey, that was meant to be such a great event. And eh, you know, now it's over. I'm not really that sure. All of this introversion that happens on a momentary daily, it's really checking back to your feelings more than it is your thoughts. Right? But, but in any case, if, if somebody like Julian Jaynes can prove that there was a time in which there was no introspection, no sense of biographical eye, no questioning uh, what you did. So then we have this new, you know, in other words, he would say in his words, it's not a normal neural phenomena. You know, you can see what all the neurons are doing, but introspection itself doesn't seem to be, you know, anything but extremely unusual and different. It doesn't really exist in any of the animals or plants. Their focus is almost entirely the world, not how they feel about it. They're not able to stand back and have awareness. We're aware of many processes. That is so original and unique is, is where he's coming at it. Uh, well, a lot of, a lot of uh, psychologists and neuroscientists do the same. And the way that they would put it is that consciousness is not just reducible to cognition. You know, the actual movement of neurons and the nervous system, that's just your natural functions. But consciousness, look, how many species have that cognition going on at various phases, but consciousness, that seems to be a, of a premium. And self-consciousness, even more, because animals are certainly conscious. Great, great, you know, very, very deep study. Uh, and he did. And, and his evidence then came from the deep study of the past, of the arts, especially the writings, but also the customs of ancient man. He's focused on Homeric, man, this is Grecian, you know, the time of the Iliad, the Odyssey, these great sweeping stories. But one of those great sweeping stories is the Old Testament. And he kind of realized that the stories that are told in the Old Old Testament have tremendous differences from those that come even later in the Old Testament or in any, any of the world's traditions, but particularly this because he knew that the Judeo-Christian world is very familiar with those texts. All right, he says. 
why does none of the heroes, prophets, big characters, Abraham, Joseph, you know, the, the whole slew of them, Saul, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, why are none of these characters introspective? It's all big Cecil Duke Me DeMille answering to God's voice outside, answering to the Pharaoh, talking to the crowd, talking to the, you know, the holy ones. There's never any of these moments of the great philosopher sitting and worrying or sitting there contemplating. You don't get this. You get it only in some late characters of the later Old Testament. But the bulk of it, there's no such introspection. David, Solomon, whoever you're dealing with, don't sit down and ponder and, and existentially, you know, question themselves. They just act directly on what God is saying. So that's what I mean about these writings. And he honed in on the Old Testament and he honed in on, on the Iliad. Uh, and, and that's why he's found this extraordinary fact that up until this Homeric period, you don't get introspection in any of the great works. Even when you think that you may be doing a close reading shows, no, no, that this is this is not the case. In all these world religions, and so in 1972, then he wanted to do a paper on that, which then led to the book. And uh, <clears throat> a, new, a new concept of consciousness as its origins was born. What he's basically saying is that the consciousness of the ancients, and these would be the people whose accounts are meant to be in the Old Testament, probably the authors of even the Testaments, you know, the author of the Book of Enoch, you know, whatever you've got, Greek works, apocryphal works, their mentality was radically different than ours. For instance, before the, before the Iliad, there's not even a word for mind. There is no word for mind uh, uh, up until, say, the 8th century BC. So 800, 700 years BC, before that period, you don't even get a word for thought or mind. And by the way, just to let you remind people, mind, even in our language, mind is a verb. It's, a, it's already action. So check that out. It's a verb, meaning a process. What? And other words for mind that we have today, or say in a different language like Latin or Greek, when you actually trace it back, it just stops. It doesn't have any solid uh, antecedent. Their antecedents of these words trace to recent historical times. And in many of the ancient, most ancient chronicles and stories and myths and sagas, there's not even a word for it. Plenty of words for action, plenty, plenty of scenes of action, but not of contemplation in the sense where, you know, you can, the eye is, is being related, like it would be saying later in Shakespeare in Plato. Uh, sorry, uh, what am I talking about? Uh, in Shakespeare in the terms of Hamlet or Othello. There's no brooding. There's no sitting alone by candlelight contemplating one's moral infractions or anything like that. It, in other words, it's these processes of introspection are recent in history. So this is, this is where we're at, right? So, all right, great. Tell us what they did before then. And so Julian James's work is to try and sketch out what kind of thinking if, if even we were thinking, was going on. And this will have an impact for psychology, you know, the neuroscience, why there's two and more uh, hemispheres of the brain. It, it has impact. And that's why it's, it's unforgivable that it's been <coughs> basically thrown aside. And so for religious people, how many of them listening to us have thought about what kind of actual thinking was going on back there? And even a more radical, was it, was it so drastically different? than we're familiar with in 3,000 years following this Homeric period. Now, bicameral means two enclosures or uh, chambers, actually would be a better word. So that relates to, you know, that uh, the brain, well, we have two chambers in the brain. It's the right and left hemisphere. So those were really up to speed with that. Yeah, this is going to be mapped over that. Um, but we only have time here to sketch it out in the most basic way, right? So he would have said that what we now call right brain is uh, 
maybe where the verbal, there, there was a thing called verbal hallucinations. And the left brain was originally just a listener. It heard these, what can only be called internal hallucinations. But these were, these voices were taken as the voices of the gods, plural. And they were issuing instructions about how to live. So we've answered the question. We didn't think in this sort of biographical way with a central self. We heard voices. And of course, that answers then why there's a metaphorical space. They've studied schizophrenics today who have this problem and then go, okay, now we have some understanding of why you assume that there is this metaphorical headspace in which things are happening and voices are heard. So we, on the other hand, then after this, after this uh, period of hearing these audio uh, hallucinations started to fade and it took hundreds of years, took up to a thousand years for this to happen. The modern age, according to Jane's, really begins in, in terms of a hard identifiable ego and again, autobiographical self. So one hemisphere spoke, one hemisphere sort of listened and followed. And what when the instructions came in, they were considered the origin, that's why it's important for our work here, of the gods, plural. Later it would change. Uh, you know, the single voice of a God would come later. So during this period, we heard these voices within, and that gave us the effect, you know, like a pinhole camera or whatever way you want to look at this, of a voice inside. This is the key, the inside. But it's purely metaphorical, says Julian James. And work I'm going to be doing in the future is going to dive into that to see if that's true, or there's even another account of you know metaphor and all that we don't want to get into right now uh, but just the idea of an internal space how what why are we why are we why have we gone through school and not ever been asked about that i mean this is not like stanford level of you you know university oh yeah i had to get to university before i inquired about the space within but then you know the defunctness of, of the world the defunctness of our education and how many people have autonomously stopped for one second to say who's this voice talking why do I imagine it's got a signature me on it? It's just a voice in the head. And, and, let, and more so, where did it come from? What's its actual etiology? What's its actual history? It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So when I was reading Julian James and similar people back then in the 90s and what have you, it fascinated me. Hell, it fascinated me since the 70s, growing up watching Doctor Who, the Mask of the Mandragora. Check that episode out and see what happens to you. So... One other thing he added that we didn't really quite underline here is that communication was now the replacement for the bicameral period. There was, if, if the voice of instruction of the gods fades for any reason, and he claims it did, one thing is that we're going to need some structure. We, we need to know what to do. The direction manual, it's like a direction manual covered in you know, rain. It's like it's just ink on the paper. Oh, my God, what do I do? So human communication and human language then takes on a much different role. It probably existed before, but in a very primitive state. Now it, it was needed because of the added need of instruction. And so this maps over what linguists know about the evolution. Like I said, in the Homer, there's not even a, a word for the color blue, for instance. It's another one, right? Uh, there's also sorts of omissions. But James's genius was to notice the omissions in terms of any reference to a cognitive process. Nobody sits down and mulls for any length of time. Or doubts. Oh, the, no, there's doubt, but it's, it's doubt in a very, it's inflected towards a very physical sort of demeanor or disposition. So bicameral man then obviously acted more like a robot, which is another way of saying that whatever the voices were doing, they were kind of unconscious. Uh, if you ask somebody, why are you doing that? They just look at you and go, meaningless. Don't understand. I don't, I don't contemplate why I do anything. There's no why in my doing. There's just raw doing. So it takes you a bit of, takes you know, us to wrap our minds around this. Like you would never ask a child, so why are you doing that? Well, this is the child life of mankind historically. There was, they couldn't answer because it never dawned on them to ask why they're doing a particular thing. 
And James is unpacking that by saying, well, even if in the building of a house or the making of fishing nets or whatever, or making of a bow and arrow, anything that they would have done, they would have done because they were instructed to do it. And another thing he adds is that the voices may have faded because we got living in bigger, bigger uh met, you know metropolitan areas when when they were living in small villages it apparently the voices were stronger and it was easier to carry out their uh instructions as things got more amorphous you know and, and people can criticize this this is just his idea that they started to fade as more voices are heard outside more influences there's a star trek from the original series but i can't remember the name of it of course but it is about uh, people living in the Garden of Eden and worshiping a big serpent head. Uh, I can put a link below later if we find the name of it. And uh, the serpent, the serpent is a big oracle that just speaks, and you do, and that's it. And of course, everyone is perfectly happy because there's no self-reflexivity to make you unhappy. There's no contemplation of your place in the universe. There's no dilemmas necessarily, and even if there is. The big voice is going to tell you, here's how to get out of it. So this could then create a per perpetual innocence. Right. Right. Remember that. A perpetual state of innocence that is a very beloved state when the big authority is telling us what to do and how to do it. Mark that. We'll come back to that. But again, just on the primitive level, hey, why did you do that? No answer will come at that point. Now, this is, you can map a, a few things over this. Without going into great detail, Freud's uh, origin of the superego, probably one of the centers of the man's work. But this thing called the superego that grows out of the ego, this can be mapped over that because it also is some sort of interjection of a, a, you know, from an outside source, but it also works as a voice in the head. James, the voice is inside and works on that to get us to have our own biographical voice. That's the etiology is mostly from inside. But <clears throat> Freud is saying, well, you know, no, the parents, it's their stern voice. And the carrot and the stick methodology, you know, that turns the super ego within. And then that takes over the rulership of consciousness. It might flood you with guilt, for instance. Now, we don't know if in the bicameral period, guilt played a part. It probably did in some way. If I disobey the voices, uh, I go and throw myself off a cliff. I, I'm riddled with guilt, you know, uh, and that's a possible origin of lighting candles and doing rituals, you know, and, the, and your previous guest talked about blood rituals. So I thought, hey, well, wait a minute, if that guilt, did, if there was a guilt mechanism happening, it's unlikely because the superego is the origin of the guilt complex. But wait a minute, there, you know, there may have been a version of that. They may have been a nucleated version of guilt, and that could have then said, I must sacrifice to the God immediately, you know, I'm, to, to show I'm sorry. So there's, there's, like I said, there's lots of uh, ways to go with this, but in this bicameral state, because you were instructed minute by minute, you didn't really need a memory. So memory is something that probably in the form that it is today is recent as well, because you have to once you have the biographical self, the autobiographical self, then you need memory to make it a continuum. But if you're just obeying instructions, there's really no need because they'll instruct you again. I don't need to refer to the previous pages to say, well, what did we do last time? There's no need. You're just going to do what you'll do this time. End of story. Remember, there's no I at this point. That is a late development. I wonder how many religious people know that. And if anything is recent, if anything is nascent, if anything is abiding in innocence, it's weak. It needs structure. Now, in other work, I make clear that um, we as human beings still struggle. In fact, if we talked about any pathological condition like schizophrenia and all the other cocktail of them, could those be born from the pathology of this sense of self-reflexivity and this self-reliance? If all of that's, if all differentiated states are recent, and then the, the, the great need to focus only on yourself and be instructed by yourself, isn't that going to create a tremendous uh, reaction of insecurity? Well, it has, and I'm not the only, you know, scholars all over the world have accepted this, that that level of autonomy is deeply threatening. We most of us still prefer to be told what to do. 
You know, wear your mask. Yeah, okay, whatever. So conscious, willful, self-asserting, self-directing uh, states of consciousness are recent and they are loathed by most people. Does that account for the hyper-collectivism of which religion is a part? You don't have religion without collectivism. Sorry, they go together, right? Are we, under, are we looking at something to explain it here? And the fanaticism of which you want to shut the door on the world and, or even shut the door on the whole creation? You know, when you believe in the supernatural entity, uh, most, most of those, including Christianity, are patently Gnostic or quasi-Gnostic, in which you just see the world of reality as a filthy place that you can't wait to get rid of. But James's, James's idea led, to, led some to believe that uh, the bicameral mind was as similar, as I say today, the last vestige of it can be seen in the schizophrenic. And there's a lot of work that's been done on that. They hallucinate, hallucinate all the time. They hear voices. They have a very sort of weak and vague sense of selfhood. The self schema, as it's called, it's not particularly strong with schizophrenics. They too live a rather impoverished life. They're never motivated to create anything. They, they literally could sit down and stare at a wall for hours. There's no inner life. But if you tell them, hey, dinner's ready, come on. Okay, let's go. Yeah. In other words, little ego control. And I always find myself that the history of the ego, the history of the divisions of the psyche, these were extremely interesting subjects. Now, of course, a couple of things come from this, right? If you're just following orders of some hallucinated voices inside your head, then everybody's doing the same thing. So it goes without saying that this is hive mind. This is the, the essence of collectivism. And today, when some meathead gets up and proclaims, you know, to all of us, this is the way to go, we, we, we have this extra hypnotic attention, don't we? You know, Obama or whatever it might be, you see, this AOC or whatever, we have this extra level of attention. It wouldn't even matter. It could, it could be Trump or anybody else. What is that dynamic all about? Well, if for thousands of years you were like, hail master, yeah, then these phenomena today can be quite easily understood, right? And uh, any national fantasies, any collective hysteria, as we've witnessed over and over again for the last five years, and educated people have seen it all the way through the decades, you know, the Nazis, the Soviets, the communists, you know, uh, the unbelievable, oh, the, every, the football game, you know, all of this collectivism is implicated here in the chorus, the Greek chorus. So, now, after the collapse, the voices start to fade. This is what really interests me a lot. And so when that happens, several things that can be gleaned from James's work come about, and they're all fascinating. One is, and I'm abbreviating this list, but one is the worship of the dead. So you go back into the ancient pre-Celtic world, you get the skull. And you find this worship of the skull across the planet in various forms. Because now that the voices have gone, bodies, dead bodies were preserved in a very special way because they believed that the dead body still contained the voice. And so you had to be reverent. And maybe on certain occasions, the dead will speak to you. That's where we get necromancy from. Because now it's born out of extreme panic. So you preserve the skull as an oracle that might speak to you or, or give you directions or whatever. You have a special reverence toward the grave that the dead are put in. They dig up places in different parts of the world where there's mass graves. I mean, just bodies piled on each other like a mound. And that place they find out later was very sacred. Yeah, because if the voices are fading, wouldn't then the people come near to where the dead are? And, you know, and for all you know, the voices did resign. This is what Julian James is saying. The hallucinations were stronger around a dead body, around. It was actually there. When you were in the presence of the dead, you actually heard the voices. Like the volume had suddenly, you know, static on a radio. I had like, oh, the static is gone. I hear, I hear. Check out another Doctor Who series from the 70s called uh, Face of Evil. This is all brought out. So, and then not only the graves, but the reliquaries of the dead, their effects. Remember the pharaohs, 
They were always buried with loads and loads of personal belongings and effects. That was a, a sort of a solve. That was a hope that the voice would speak. As time went by, we started to venerate idols, but these are votive idols. Votives are the little statuettes that you keep finding in Syria when they dig up, you know, and even in India, you still get it today. And the whole idea that a little statue, like these Catholics, uh, Mother Mary nonsense in Ireland, oh, I sure have to have that. And then, you know, the Lady of Guadalupe, you know, the little icon, the little statue that's put reverently uh, on an altar. Actually, Julian Jane says the voices used to come through those. That's how that all began. And that could be as primitive as like a stone. I think you're going back too far, but even stone worship, should you have it today with the ling Shiva Lingam and people buying, you know, a crystal or the whole Pallava buying a picture of the Madonna or whatever, right? This is all coming out of that, he says. And you sit in front of it and just hope that it'll speak to you. Then in the desperation came sacrifice. This is why watching your previous guest, I felt that was such a brilliant uh, thesis that she was saying there. Is because, yeah, here's, here's the reason for God and a sacrifice, be it in blood or anything else. Desperation. I got to have those voices back. Let me, you know, throw a couple of skinned animals in, in the mix or, you know, let me sacrifice my baby or something like that. To win back the voice of the gods, because without it, I'm just basically, I wouldn't even know how to till a field. I wouldn't even know how to bring water from the well. So then... James gets ambitious and says that the fall of the great Sumeria and Egypt and Persia is occurring. Babylon, whatever you've got, is, this is the result of the decline of the voices of the gods. The essence of those civilizations where the Pharaoh and his priests are the ones who hear the voice of the gods, it's no longer happening. So chaos in the streets. Chaos in the streets. And the idea is that uh, you know, we're, we're not instructed. The whole hierarchy dissolves. There's no reason for it. There's, there's like, you know, uh, the master is dead at his desk and there's no more memos coming down, no more instruction. So there's evidence that even whole cities were abandoned. And James puts this down to the evacuation of these cities. Uh, the Anastasi Indians would be just one that jumps to head, my head, but there's been plenty more. These, these were happening because the, the central voice was, was no longer speaking. And he says that this accounts for a lot of dispersion of European and other races where they're just sort of walking about. You know, it's over. That level of that phase of civilization is over. Also, when you move about like that and you're, you're increasingly a big horde of people, just the problems of life become more complex. The very opposite of what you need when you're having a direct instruction. Now there's too much to do. Now there's too many things that need to be instructed and not a central oracle showing you what to do. That then leads to the lack of a feeling of structure, which in, in terms of culture and civilization, you know, that's the end of it. And so the, the final voices fade. Uh, at the, and then what comes after that is the historical period. Different dates are offered. Hey, but, you know, 1000 BC, the Homeric period, after which the voices are basically gone, except maybe in a few exceptional people, a few exceptional circumstances, a few exceptional places. But it's basically over this era. So anyone left who claims to hear the voices or who does, don't you see, they become a venerated beyond war. Even emperors will want to come and take their control. Caesar, you know, will stick them out. Well, now we're at the phase of the priesthood. The phenomena of priesthood is explained by Julian James. He's not the only one to theorize, but this is a particularly profound and I think very accurate because now that the internal voices are gone, wouldn't you expect a bunch of charlatans? Here's everybody in a, just in a totally dispersed situation, all unstructured. And it's easy for uh, people to come along. Close this down here. To say, yes, but we hear the gods. We are your new instructors. No, you're not. Get out of here. No, no. The priesthoods were super successful, be they in Egypt. And so the Judaic period, the Israelite period, Julian James looks to this and they're chronicle the Old Testament and the antics that go on and the meeting of this Jehovah on the hill. 
uh, uh, you know, led by Moses. Something's going on here it's where the priest is now saying, listen to me and I'll lead you back. He doesn't have much currency if it's just listen to me. You know, that came later. Listen to me because I know where the voice of the gods are. Oh, brilliant. That's exactly what we've been looking for. Show us the way, mate. Oh, it's across the you know, milk and honey river and it's up there in the mountain and all this. And so the priesthoods begin. And then one priesthood, one priest creates a priesthood, Melchizedek, you know, Aaron, the Levites, the Shilohites, the who have you got, right? The rabbis, all of it. They're jumping on this bandwagon right quick to exploit the fact that people are lost and people need this structure. And as I said, side to them, guess what you get? Julian James is quite clear to say that other wise people, even witches, the whole, all of this stuff of witches and sages and soothsayers and sibyls, oracles, starts to emerge at this point, really because the voices have gone. So a lot of this is bound to be chicanery from a very early period. But what we're talking about now is, of course, external instruction. Something massive has taken place. And it's seen in the literature of the ancients, in which now it's all about what king, what priest has to rival and fight with others and get to the top of the heap. Also, language, remember, is part of that external instruction. So this is the era in which you get sophistry. You get language ramping up and you get sophistry because it's the one with the silver tongue who's going to probably be your new leader. And then the politicians see that and they go, hey, hey we got to adopt that. And so, you know, by the time of Plato, this is, this is already quite mature, this idea. But even on a, a more uh, secular level, prayer. <clears throat> prayer comes about because you may be sitting in front of this idol or whatever, or a cauldron or a skull or something. And you generally now need to pray to get the voices back. We're doing it today. And all that prayer is, is a call to say, inner voice instruct me. I'll make a, even a special shrine in my house. Uh, we'll design a temple, a special temple on a special hill in the city and the town. And what fascinated me, because I'm into the divination arts, what, what fascinated me, me when I read it is that divination in the form of astrology, tarot, whatever, grew out of this as well. The voices are not speaking to you directly. So you have to go to a soothsayer, you go to a witch, you go to somebody who can you know, cast the spells uh, or just lay out a chart you know, throw some yarrow sticks around, uh, read a turtle's back, uh, read your palm, you know, whatever it might be. This is one of the great origins of this. And in my studies to do with tarot and divination, I came across this and found it extremely accurate. If you take out the major arcana, for instance, you'll, it's all in there. The, this story is actually, I wish these highbrows in Princeton who wanted to debunk Julian James actually knew anything about anything, but they don't. So there you go. But what we would call oracles, the oracle of Delphi, the oracle of Sa uh, Samothrace, the oracle of Ephesus, uh, the oracle to which the pharaoh and his, uh, his, his mother and, the, and the, the wife would constantly go. And they gave advice, right? Uh, today, we say, like these televangelists, but other people speak of internal mystical experiences, inner guides. Look at this new age thing about inner, I'm hearing the inner guide. Oh, and as I said, then came the rule. See, most of my work on James is done in my female Illuminati thesis in, in the DVD, the program, because I was trying to show how the priestesses became powerful because as oracles became powerful, women priestesses were known pretty much for the first time, especially in the sort of ubiquitous way, like the Sibylline oracles, for instance, and the Sibylline books are the entire basis of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is actually a very poorly written uh, rescripting uh, uh, redaction of the Sibylline oracles that were known throughout the whole of the Roman Empire and from before. And everything that you get inside the book of Revelation is from the Sibylline oracles in a sort of a jumbled way. And this, should, this was known to scholars. So why, why that debate has raged for years, I just can't even imagine. But the idea is that uh, these then became the advisors and there's so much chicanery involved in it. Women starting to set themselves up as oracles, you know, read the entrails. And if you look at the major arcana, card two is the high priestess. Card three is the empress. There's a reason for that. And she's holding a scroll. 
the high priestess is holding a scroll. So an age came where you not only had priesthoods, but you had a whole gynocracy. And the Old Testament wanted to, you know, had a, there was wars raging. It's all secretly in the Old Testament. So they just wanted to scrub that cult, even though they appropriated loads and loads of motifs. Right? But this is the cult of Asherah, the cult of Anat, the cult of Astarte. It was all over Canaan and Syria. And so when you hear about drinking the blood, like your previous guest was talking about, what might not be clear is that actually, even though it's a priest doing it, he's appropriated that motif. It's thousands and thousands of years older. It's actually part of the goddess cults. And even his costume, the way he dresses, you know, and all the rest of it, and where he gather at a mound and all, half the stuff, if not more, is actually nothing to do with male cultism. It was abstracted, like you do when you go and loot a culture, you say, now it's ours. But, you know, a clever person looking back and say, none of that is yours. This was nothing. Even ritual sacrifice was probably not a male invention. I argue in the female Illuminati that all of that, whether it's castration or it becomes circumcision or drinking from a, a cup, blood from a cup, baby's blood, even all of that, that's nothing to do with men. That's an appropriation. We're already talking about way late in the day. So that needs to be added as well. But your reason for going, the Caesar's wife goes to an oracle, it's to gain instruction. So James has basically got there himself there a powerful theory that should not be dismissed. It is supported. Uh, in fact, even the critics, when they hone in on what they think are the weaker parts of his work, like how could this all happen simultaneously across the world? There's no connection between these tribes. They were cut off by water or they were cut off. Nobody knew each other. You know, these fatuous, idiotic critiques. Yeah, ever heard of a thing called cataclysm? Catastrophism? That happened all over the world. And you just need to plug that into James's work and it all, it's all consistent. What's wrong with you people? Get out your Velikovsky. It's not really that hard. Get out your Velikovsky. Get out your Julian James and see if the dots connect. But see, we are living with such deceivers. So again, that's what I've done. Catastrophism explains what, where a trauma came from. Because one of the weaknesses in James is he doesn't really explain where the bicameral period started. He talks about it and the, you know, leading up to where we are. But what kind of events caused the bicameral period? He hints that it's trauma. He actually does hint that it is trauma, but then drops it. Drops it doesn't go into any detail with that. So that you know, can be seen as a fault or we could chase it up and find out, hey, wait a minute. And then you've, you bring in People who did talk about trauma and you link them together. And then you have your answer. The great ancestral trauma that I speak about shattered the brain, shattered our consciousness. And to hold that consciousness together, it's quite likely that we heard these auditory hallucinations as an attempt of consciousness to hold itself together after a devastating uh, event that would cause massive worldwide dissociation. So the stupid critics are just having you on. They're not critics at all. Then, to come to the conclusion here, you see, what we've been saying, right, is, and now it can be explicitly said, in the need for external instruction, we get religion. Oh, we don't get one religion, we get the religions all over the world. All over the world, I don't care where you're coming from, the worship of votaries and amongst the aboriginals in, in Australia and Latin America, the Celts with their skulls and their shield and the gigs, and their extreme emphasis on stone circles and oracles and God knows what, the, the Egyptians, the Copts. Once you've understood James's theory, you're really up to speed on a lot of phenomena. The guy at the end of the, you know, at the church, he's that, because we're doing it. But later it becomes, okay, like I said, language gets really, really polished. Religion is instantiated, never to go away. And we start getting open to all the different paths and schools, all the different ideas and traditions. Yeah, because we're looking for external instruction. Because we've lost the lodestone, we've lost, lost the inner mooring when life was so much simpler and easier. And so that was, that's why we might even have turned to solar worship. Of course, solar worship predates even the bicameral period. But even though a thing may have been there before, what we're talking about now is it really become emphasized. Divination has been tracked to China long before the bicameral period. Yeah, but it's not that the phenomena began. It's just that the phenomena was now more ramped up. It was more assiduously <clears throat> worshipped. So much so that we needed these female oracles. And that's the beginning of your feminism. That's the beginning of your female power. 
is because of the loss of the voice of the internal gods and goddesses. Right? Anyone can come along now and say, yeah, you know, I can read some entrails or whatever. And it's not even to say that those oracles don't work. That's a whole subject, you know, that would last for a while. Does the, does the divination work? Is astrology the replacement of the voice of the gods in some bizarre way? Does it even work? Maybe it does for you or for somebody else. Or the tarot cards can be seen in a new light now. But the greater reliance on the external authority gives you the priest, gives you the priesthood, gives you the king. It gives you Confucius. It gives you Muhammad. It gives you Buddha. It's what he says I'm going to follow gives you Jesus. We, we are the ones demanding and saying it's okay that now it's reduced to one figure. You know, it's Abraham. Good. We're back to that simplicity. It's Jesus. Back to simplicity. Back to, oh. My brain, my structure, eh, once was oriented in this un unpleasant place called reality through these inner internal voices. If I can't have them again, uh, you know, or to return to that kind of state means I'm schizophrenic, I'll be put into a rubber room. Well, you know, the next best thing is to take external instruction, but from somebody's voice. And if that guy says, I'm enlightened, I see the light, I can lead you to paradise. Shit, that's, that's a good deal. That's, that's, that's what we want. Yeah, that's the manual for me. So there's a lot to comprehend in this for sane people to contemplate, you know, not say yay, not say... Yes or no. But sadly, most people are not up to it. This is a very, uh, it would require a lot of uh, gray cells to get into this. To, you know, it requires neuroscience and a lot of other psychologies and, and really stepping back and zooming out from what you believe. You know, and of course, we know that that's, and right down into the, your DNA, that's not what we want. The earlier man from which we're descended was a puppet on a string. And his life was much more simple than it is now. But I'm just a believer that, you know, we need to step up. We need to get familiar. If you believe, if you're a believer in something, get up and don't be afraid to look at all sides of the question. The basic questions, something, and also something more tricky. Don't just accept that, that you know, that's not a good thing. And maybe down the line, you know, we, we can look at more deeply at what James is talking about, uh, because there is this, uh, we really do have to understand the nature of psychopathology multiple personality disorder how you can not just have one voice in your head as we said earlier but a multiplicity of them uh, but i think we've done a really good job here sketching out the basics uh, and showing that this is a very plausible origin of religion michael tazarion thank you